you, Svetlana. Well, thank you, Svetlana. And uh, now I'll, I would invite Helen Derbyshire, who has a very mysterious talk titled, What Have We Really Changed? Please welcome Helen. sharing water here, but I don't really mind. Um, well, good afternoon. Um, first of all, I think very cognizant of um, the instruction from Jeremy that we have to have fun. I'm going to give a fairly brief presentation so we can actually put that into practice. Um, what I want to do is just ask a, a, a little question about how much uh, impact we're having and perhaps come up with one or two proposals about what we need to do leaving here today, or a, a couple of ideas for that at least. Um, th first of all, thanks very much to the people who brought us here, to Andrew, to Mika, to Caro, to the whole PDF uh, team and to the, to the funders who've enabled us physically to come here. Uh, we, we're all very active on the internet. We're networked, we, t we tweet, we connect with each other in multiple uh, virtual ways, but there really is nothing like uh, coming here, being together, and talking both in these more formal sessions and in the coffee breaks. Uh, one of the, the questions that's been going around on the Twitter feed today is whether we have a, and Stephen King raised it this morning, whether we have a, a coherent community, whether we want to build a, com a coherent community, which uh, Martin Tisney wants to achieve before he retires, apparently. Um, I, I don't know, it, I'm not going to try to answer that question, perhaps it is an important question, but whatever kind of community we are, by the, the virtue of the fact that we've been here together today, we're strengthening that community. And I do see in the room people from the different silos, as they've been described, coming and exchanging experiences, exchanging ideas. We've, we've showcased some of our successes, but I would also say, and this is very important, that there has been some space for reflection about wh what impact we've actually had and the lessons that we can learn from our failures as well. Um, one of the concerns was, that was raised was that sometimes we focus too much on the tools and not about the impact of the tools. And that's part of the concern that lies behind my question in terms of what impact we're actually having. How much are we changing the way that government happens? Uh, that we've, had, we've had specific examples of this. Um, I, I paid a bribe, for example, one of the much vaunted uh, tools for fighting against corruption in some countries, I think it was Hungary that was mentioned, has had to be taken down because of threats of defamation suits. Uh, another example from my society's Fix My Street, that works really well in the country I come from, the UK, because people are very used to uh, complaining, to raising concerns, to insisting that something be, do be done, and government, local government in particular, is very used to responding to those concerns. In a different context, the country that I live in and that the organization that I run, Access Info, is based in, namely, namely Spain, we've had four different Fix My Street applications, none of which has worked. One of them was even launched by a regional government, and nobody used it. Why not? Because of a certain cynicism around the um, willingness and, and whether the government would actually respond to those complaints and do anything about the problems that are reported. So the tools are very much depend the, and the effectiveness of the tools are very much dependent on the context in which they're used. And part of what we've been discussing today has been our ability to evaluate and assess that context. And that's almost as big a challenge as devising the tools in the first place. Uh, difficult, it's difficult to know in advance how we're going to have an impact, and it's difficult to know if we transplant one, a solution from one place to another without adjusting it to the local context, whether it's really going to be effective. And those are very important questions because we do have limited resources to spend on those tools. Uh, and it's very important to be asking ourselves, what's the problem we're solving here? What's, what's our strategy to solve that problem? And will this particular tool actually help us? 
the discussions here today have reflected some of the skepticism that's floating around in articles that are circulating on the internet about uh, whether or not, as we develop new solutions, the politicians just get wise and change the way they do business. One recent article made the analogy to, uh, to the mafia. When the mafia know that the police are listening to them, what do they do? They talk about banalities while they're passing each other notes under the table. So are we, as, as we respond to uh, problems that we're trying to solve, the, the problems shift location somewhere else. That's a concern. There's also a slightly unspoken, but it's hovering there, uh, concern about how much democracy do we really want? How good is a total democracy if it results in a, a, a mob type of decision making? Uh, again, this is a question that's been asked recently. Um, what, what's the value of total direct democracy as practiced in a country like Switzerland in full country referenda if it results in decisions which are effectively intolerant, such as to um, limit the construction of mosques? What's the good of having an informed society if we still vote for people like Berlusconi, which looks like it might happen again, or uh, for Golden Dawn in Greece? Um, in, in, in Europe right now, we're, we're seeing some very anti-democratic trends. We know that they're happening, and yet somehow we seem, we seem, I'm not saying that we are, but we seem perhaps powerless to stop them, or at least it, it's, it's very frustrating after all the, the democracy work that's been done in this region of Europe in the last 20 years. 20 odd years to see the black backsliding. Access to information, Hungary the very first country in the region to adopt an access to information law, um, but still that transparency hasn't been enough uh, to stop an anti-democratic government coming into place. So what are we really changing? It's a question. A counter example to that, uh, which we've heard various times during the course of the day, quite appropriately as we are here in, in, in Warsaw in Poland, was the, the massive campaign to defeat ACTA. And that certainly was very impressive. And the role that Polish civil society, uh, that Polish people in general played in that was, was significant. There's no doubt about that. And more examples like that, it, it, would be good, it would be good to have more of them. We defeated a bad law, or in this case, a bad, a bad treaty. That that was being adopted in a very undemocratic fashion. And that's fantastic. The question is, have the political processes which allowed ACTA to possibly happen actually changed as a result of the defeat of ACTA? And I would say no, they haven't, not yet at least. And, and we still see decisions being taken behind closed doors in Brussels. We've got... Uh, a, a recent scandal, I don't know if many of you have been following it, but we had the Commissioner for Health and Consumer Policy, Dali, resign on the base of a tobacco industry lobbying scandal, but the details of that scandal have still not been made public. It's fairly amazing that an EU Commissioner has to resign, and we don't know exactly what was going on behind the scenes, what caused, what, precisely what led to that resignation. We've got a data protection directive going through and concerns have been expressed about that today and yet we don't have all the information about the positions that different member states are taking in the negotiations around that directive. Uh, my organization Access Info Europe has a case against the Council of the European Union to try to get access to the documents from the working parties inside the Council of the European Union and to get the names of the country so we can know which countries are lobbying for a particular measure and which countries are against it. Uh, we don't know. Um, we won the case at the first instance uh, and the, the General Court of the European Union, Union ruled that that information should be public, but it was appealed by the Council and not only by the Council, but by the Council joined by five member states, France, the Czech Republic, Greece, Spain and the United Kingdom. All those countries arguing that we as citizens don't have a right to know what positions our governments are taking in Brussels. So we have big challenges still 
in terms of the democratic process, both at the national level and with many more decisions being taken at the Brussels level, at the Brussels level as well. We've, we've got... Oh, have I given up on my... Ah, yes, here we are. Um, we've, we've, we've got all these buzzwords floating around. The question is, then, what... Uh, I'm sorry. Um, one, one of the challenges in front of us, then, uh, if we're trying to assess our impact on, uh, on the political process, is for us to be clear what we mean by the buzzwords we're using and to be able to measure the, uh, the, 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 the levels of, for example, tr democracy, well, transparency, participation, uh, accountability. These, uh, we've heard talk today of the Open Government Partnership. Transparency, participation, un and accountability are put forward as pillars of open government. Open democratic government is what we're talking about, what we're trying to achieve. And yet, the definitions of these terms are not completely clear. In terms of transparency and access to information, I would say we've made most progress. In terms of accountability, we do have definitions in the anti-corruption field, but it's a word which doesn't translate well into many languages, and we don't have measures of uh, the, the, the exact um, accountability mechanisms in all areas. Even with transparency, in fact, whilst we can assess access to information laws, how much openness, how much data do we actually have? We don't have any real comparative measure of that, particularly not when it comes to the type of information which we need to defend democracy, to participate in decision making, and to defend human rights. So if we, and we don't even have standards for that. Uh, in the open government context, there's a lot of talk about publishing crime statistics, for example, but there's no agreement on exactly how detailed those crime, that crime data should be or what kind of information precisely it should contain. Should it contain information that we need to evaluate how many crimes are motivated by, um, how much uh, raci racially motivated crimes or crimes um, that are relate to gender violence. Not all countries publish that data. So we need better definitions in order to be able to get uh, better measures of what's going on. And we also need the resources in order to be able to do the measurement. Uh, we need to, so we need to define, I'm going to go on. I'm just going to give you some, ah, sorry. <laughs> um, I'm just going to give you some, some recent measurements of what European Union citizens feel about the levels of uh, transparency, both around the European Union and at the national level. This is, we've been very privileged under a, a project run in six countries across the European Union to be able to conduct an opinion poll about what people want. And this comes back to Svetlana's point about not, about the, mind the gap, um, let's not forget the public and what the public is actually demanding as we move forward. I know that many of us are, are doing that, but I think it's worthwhile remembering to touch base with what public opinion wants, not only in order to make what we're doing relevant, but also in order to be able to argue to governments, uh, to be able to argue to governments um, that we, in our demands, are supported by a large base of people in the public. Sometimes you can do that by having a lot of people out in the streets, as with the demonstrations for ACTA, Sometimes if you're lucky enough to be able to do an opinion poll, you can get some data. So this is data from, as I said, 6,000 people in six countries. 80% of those people want mandatory regulation of lobbying. Similar numbers, numbers of people polled expressed concerns about the fact that big business is having too much say in the decisions which are taken in Brussels. That, that's a very high number. It's, it's interesting that uh, the numbers were fairly, the countries in, included Austria, France, the Czech Republic, Spain, the UK, and the Netherlands. And basically the numbers were the same across all those countries, with perhaps when it came to questions about the EU, slightly lower numbers in the UK for some reason. Um, 
In terms of decision making at the Brussels level, and this is very relevant for the debates about things like ACTA, data retention, data protection, 85% of the people polled around the European Union want more decision making, in op open decision making in, Bru in Brussels. That, that's a fantastic support for our campaigns for openness, demonstrating that the public is behind us. We have perhaps succeeded in reaching out to the public and explaining what this is about. In fact, when we put the poll together, the pollsters told us that the questions were too complicated and wouldn't be understood. We decided to go ahead anyway. I don't think they were complicated. It's fairly straightforward. Knowing what decisions have been taken in Brussels is pretty easy for people to understand. And similarly, in the context of the financial crisis and the way the financial crisis is being solved, which I would say is actually one of the biggest challenges that we've got right now to the democratic achievements of Europe in the, in the period since the Second World War, is that the decisions about the future of our economies are really being removed from the reach of democratic accountability. Um, they're taking place in discussions between governments, the European Central Bank, the IMF, with not even parliamentarians always knowing exactly what's going on. 84% of the European public would like to know what's happening. That, that's, that's, these are the challenges which lie before us in terms of the type of democracy. And there is a slight indication there uh, in the way that decisions are being taken that as we develop all our fantastic tools, decision making slips off to another level. And we need to make sure that we reach up and catch that as well. Um, so I'm going to finish there. The, la the last comment, um, again on this point of bringing the public along with us, is just to tell you a very tiny story from Spain. We asked the Spanish government five years ago what they're doing to fight corruption. Uh, they didn't answer. We went to court. They said that we didn't have a right to ask for that information because Spain is still the only country in the European Union which doesn't have a freedom of information law. And uh, we lost the court case at the Supreme Court level uh, last year. And just before Christmas, we were told that we would have to pay 3,000 euros in costs to the Spanish government for having disturbed them with the court case. Um, uh, the, we, made, we launched about just less than two weeks ago a fundraising campaign to get that money. And we raised not only the 3,000 euros, but also a, a full 10,000 euros. And what was most amazing was that a lot of that money came in in one euro, two euro, three euro donations from members of the public. So I think that we can see in the support that we're getting, whether it's for one particular issue like that court case, whether it's for a wider issue um, that affects our, our, our human rights, um, our democracy, that we are able, as a community, again, whatever this community is, we are being successful in mobilizing people to support what we're doing. And I think that that's something that we should be inspired by, and uh, it's something to go forward and do more and better in order to have a more positive impact on the political systems, so that the decisions that are taken are really those which best serve members of the public. And that's the Access Info team saying thank you very much to everyone for your support.